Okay, let's get started. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to June Women in Tech session. Um, my name is Sarpil Bayraktar. I'm the program lead for uh, WIT. Uh, today's guest speaker is John Chapman. John is one of the few Cisco fellows and has been with the company since it was a startup. Currently, he's serving as the CTO of, uh, CTO of uh, Cable uh, Business Unit, which he himself founded many years ago. Um, John and I met only five, six years ago when I uh, started working at Cisco, but I did use the, some of the technologies he invented many, many years ago. At the beginning of my career, I was working as a network engineer for the NSFNet project. Now, for those of you who don't know what NSFNet project is, that was the NSF-funded internet research network between ARPANET and the commercial internet. And we were uh, connecting regional networks and supercomputing centers together. As part of that project, we would do these uh, frequent uh, infrastructure upgrades because the internet was being used a lot and we had to constantly increase the capacity and the speed of our links. And I looked up right before this event, in 1994 we did the phase five upgrade which included one of the inventions John actually uh, did. Uh, it was the HISI or the high speed interface we were using. So um, I take it we go way back. <laughs> John is also uh, inducted to Society of uh, Cable Telecommunications Engineers Hall of Fame and has two wonderful daughters. He's going to talk a little bit about them as well. So please help me welcoming John to Women in Technology community. Thank you. Thanks, Serpil. Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for taking time out of your day and, and, and joining us today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, cable because I know, first of all, everybody's fascinated and wants to know how cable works, but really everybody wants to know how fast their internet connection is going to be to their home. Before I get started, we thought we'd do an introductory video that kind of covers how DOCSIS works. And uh, part of it is because it's a cool video, and part of it is because I'll never get a chance to use this video anywhere else except for here because the people who are going to explain this are my two daughters. So <laughs> that, but I need to introduce it. Like, so that SCT Hall of Fame. Um, was I received that over in Florida. So I was like, well, you know, it'd be great if the family came and watched. And my wife can't travel, so I took my two girls with me and I told the GM of the cable group what I was doing. He goes, okay, well, just remember, no family's allowed on the floor. So I showed up and I said, we're here. And he goes, okay, well, just remember, absolutely no family on the floor. You go figure it out. So, you know, you're a parent, you got two kids. What can you do? You dress them up, I dressed them up really cute and took them on the floor. <laughs> you know, and so imagine, right? I show up with these two cute little girls and there's like 3,000 dads at a convention. There's like a magnet, they were, they were surrounded. And then I took them up, when I uh, got my award, I took them up on stage and introduced them as Happy Cox customers because there's a bunch of <laughs> cable customers in the audience. Nobody remembers a darn thing I said they only remember the girls. And every year, every year, I ask me if, every year they ask me if they're going to bring them back to the show. So we brought them to the booth and we got them to do an interview with me. And that's what I'm going to play today. And the interview is about DOCSIS and things like that. So with that, uh, we will roll the video. And I think there's people who are live. We're going to play the video here. on the YouTube Live and, and play a copy of the video here. Hi, I'm Michaela and Chapman, and I'm Katie Chapman, and we are here at the SETE Cable Tech Expo in Orlando, Florida, where our dad was just inducted into the Hall of Fame. Congrats, Dad. We're so Thank proud you, of you. Thank you, Shana. It's nice to be here with you. It's great to be here with you, too. So can we ask you a few questions about the award and just the show in general? But of course. About the award, what does it mean? Is it like the MTV Music Awards? You know, that's a good question, because in a way it kind of is. In, in the MTV Music Awards, the, uh, a peer group gets together and they elect the, their favorite peers and they are to get awards. And the SCT kind of works the same way. It's a whole bunch of engineers, everybody works together really well, and every once in a while they pick a few engineers uh, and induct them into the Hall of Fame. 
So it's, uh, yeah, I guess in a way you could say it is. At the MTV Music Awards, there's lots of entertainers. Is there any engineer entertainers? Uh, you know, some people find engineers very entertaining. I'll just <laughs> leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> All this time, we've heard you talk science talk on the phone. I had no idea that was about cable modems. That's cool. Well, thank you. Cool. <laughs> also, Very cool. Yes. Also, cool. we've heard this term all the time, DOCSIS 3.1. What's that all about? DOCSIS 3.1 is an exciting new technology that we're working on in the cable industry, and we're going to be launching the three, DOCSIS 3.1 as a topic to talk about in the SCT show. What we're doing at DOCSIS 3.1 is we are looking at how to take DOCSIS, which is the technology that puts data over cable, and we're going to drive it to full spectrum, and we're going to make it run really, really fast. We're going to yeah. put something in there called OFDM. We're going to jazz up the FI. We're going to put in the latest technology and uh, go full speed with it. And what's going to happen is it'll make your games run a lot faster. Wow, thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, what does OFDM stand for? Uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or uh, what was the other thing we figured it stood for? Uh, obsessive. obsessive, yeah, it was obsessive frequency obsessive division. Obsessive frequency division multiplexing. Yeah, it because it keeps changing its mind of what it wants to do and it moves all over the place, right? <laughs> but in doing so, it's a technology that is able to fit the spectrum to the forward path and the reverse path of the cable plant, make it fit like a glove. So we can really do some optimizations on the plant that we have not been able to do before, and in doing so, get better data throughput on the plant. This next question is really hard, so I'm going to read it off. So do you think that OFDM with LPDC will give your customers the headroom they need to stay ahead of consumer demand for broadband? Yes, we do. We decided now that we're going to upgrade DOCSIS, that we are going to take it. And in doing the upgrade, we really do need new ASICs at both the cable modem and at the CMTS, so at both ends of the cable. Since we're doing the ASIC refresh, it's a fantastic opportunity to go out and bring in the latest technology that exists in communications. And that happens to be OFDM and LDPC. So yes, we're definitely going to be leading edge technology as we advance towards full spectrum. What does LDPC stand for? Low density parity check. Oh, so you it's do you a, make parodies uh, of music videos? <laughs> Something like that. We, what we do is we throw in some extra information with the data that we have there. So if we drop any jokes, we can recreate the jokes with the extra bits in there. Oh, cool. Hopefully we don't put the wrong answer with the, with the right joke. <laughs> Are you personally going to help widen the upstream path? I will personally, but our customers is a very big decision for them because the technology that we are evolving and we're going to roll out can fit within the existing spectrum on a plant, and you can get a significant increase in throughput on the plant. But eventually, if you want to go for the, the big thing, if you want to get a gigabit per second in the upstream, you are going to have to add upstream spectrum. And uh, we have the equipment and the technology and the roadmap that will enable our customers to increase their upstream spectrum when they're ready to do so and when the market demands it, the solution will be there. And it is, technically cap uh, it is a technically feasible thing to go do. Is there anything else you'd like to point out? Anything we should go see? At the show? You know, I think that there's really two interesting trends going on right now at the show. One is, you've probably heard of CCAP. Do you know what CCAP stands for? Yes. yes. What does the CCAP stand for? Okay, CCAP stands for Converged Cable, Cable Access, Access Platform. Platform. Very good. So the first thing is that every, what CCAP is all about is convergence of services. So right now with analog kind of becoming less popular and being taken off the channel lineup, we're left really with digital services, and that works out to be digital video, uh, IP voice, and IP data. With all three of those being digital, we can actually run through those all through one platform. So instead of having 100 platforms in a, in a head end, everything eventually is going to go through one converged platform. That's a really big deal for operators because it means a lot less equipment and a lot higher efficiencies in operation. The next trend immediately following that is the digital video in that box is going to transfer from an MPEG transport to an IP transport. So not, will, not only will all services converge into one platform, they'll converge into one protocol. And you know what's exciting about everything being on IP? Is what? we can take all that great video that's on the plant and instead of it just going to the television in the living room, we can bring it right down to your iPad. Wow. Or down to your iPhone. Wow. Isn't that exciting? America, we'll be able to take that video and push it anywhere. 
Wow. So we've got a lot of really cool technology uh, going forward in the cable industry. It's going to really transform the way you guys live, play, work, and learn. Wow. Sweet. That's cool. Thanks, Dad, and congratulations again. Well, thank you, Shana. You're welcome. We are here at the Cable Tech Expo in Orlando, Florida. I'm Michaela Chapman. And I'm Shana Chapman. Good, Good day. day. That's pretty cute, eh? Now, it, it turns out that they used to do a little bit of Hollywood stuff, and they've got their own YouTube channel, and they do interviews. So if you want to see more, there's this Q&A with Mickey and Shay on YouTube. There's about, there's about a, I don't know, 800 interviews or something like that up there. All right, so um, let's get started. Let's do a little bit of background on cable just before I tell you the advances. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and give you a broad overview of kind of what we're doing and where we've been and where we're going. And because we've got a Cisco crowd today, highlight uh, a lot of the stuff that Cisco's put into it. Because we have an incredible story at Cisco when it comes to the cable market. But it's not a, a story that's well known or well understood because we're, we're kind of our own market. But we've done incredible things in this particular market. Uh, this is the cable speeds I get at my house. Uh, Cox is the cable provider, and it's behind a, a UBR10K, which is a Cisco box that sits at the cable center that hooks all these things together. Um, I get uh, a third of a gigabit down to my house, so 335 megabits down and about 30 megabits per second up. It's really, really fast. Um, when I went and presented to Cox, I put this up here, and then of course I put another slide up there with a picture of my girls saying thank you, and that's the only slide they remember. They don't remember any of those slides about what we were building or what we were trying to sell them. And, then they, and they didn't request my deck, they requested that slide. So I get a lot of mileage out of that. Broadband to the home. Most of the homes are actually connected over cable. Cable tends to give very fast speeds to the home because it turns out the cable plant is an engineered plant. It's an active plant with amplifiers and coax. It's made to bring television signals down to the home and data is just another TV channel. So it's, it has a lot more bandwidth in it than something like a twisted pair, which is intended for voice calls as opposed to an entire TV channel lineup. So we live on top of a very rich and powerful plant. And as a result, we have a natural competitive advantage to all the other access medias. Um, and you can see here the cable providers provide video, high-speed internet, and, and quite a bit of voice. That's interesting. There we go. How's it, so a quick thing on how the plant is built. Uh, I just want to introduce some acronyms that you'll be kind of running into. So generally the whole video lineup is put together at the head end. So they bring in, it used to be they'd bring in the TV channels over satellite. Now they just bring it over the, over the internet. But they assemble all the TV channels at the head end. And then they go out to these hubs and the hubs have the transmission equipment. So the hubs actually connect to the plant. So that's where our box fits. You know, we have a router with cable interfaces on it. So we're at the hub. We then go down fiber to a fiber node or an optical node and it converts to coax. But it's not your everyday regular fiber today, it's, it's, it's analog fiber. So what happens is they build a TV channel line up here, it comes down here and they actually put the TV channel line up on a lambda on the fiber and then it's just converted over to coax. So the same signal that's on the coax is on the fiber. It is a very cheap way of putting a lot of bandwidth on a fiber and it's how the plant's been built for 30 years, although that's something we're about to change. Once it's on the coax, it gets amplified and goes to the houses. The other thing to kind of way to look at it is it's all about spectrum planning. So spectrum is the frequencies they use in the downstream. And you've got like a little bit of space for the upstream between uh, 5 and, and 42 megahertz. And then a whole bunch of frequencies for the downstream. And the way to look at this, if you're a cable operator, this is like real estate. It's like you get 128 to 160 channels and you get to use those channels for things like HBO or government channel, and everybody pays you money. And the HBO guys pay you a lot. And I don't think the government pays you anything. You probably have to pay them, right? So you don't want a lot of government channels, you want a lot of HBO channels. So it's all about real estate. And when we put Doxus in here, which we start off with one channel, they had a third of their revenue coming from one channel out of 100 channels. They couldn't believe the money they were making on high-speed data. They, they, like customers would say, we have to pinch ourselves to make sure we're awake, that we're not dreaming. And even today, out of 128 or 160 channels, we're only using 32. 
So we've only used about 20%, 10 to 20% of the spectrum for DOCSIS. So there's a lot of room that we get to grow. So what is DOCSIS? Okay, here's the acronym slide. I'll just go, there's about six acronyms that's good to know. Here's how it fits together. So DOCSIS, that stands for Data Over Cable System Interface Specification, which you never really want to hear again. It's just how you put data on cable. DOCSIS specifies how you do IP, and we use an IP packet inside of an Ethernet frame, and then we put some other bytes around it. And then that goes on the HFC plant, which is hybrid fiber coax. So it's a hybrid plant that has fiber in it and coax in it. Uh, at the head end, you have a CMTS. That's the cable modem termination system. It hooks the cable modems. The CMTS hooks the CMs. We build the CMTS. This is the third generation of our CMTS, the CB8. Um, and you can support about 20,000 modems hanging off of that thing. Now, we did have a name change a little bit lately. There's the, the spectrum, we're only 20%, so who's the other 80%? It's actually legacy video. It used to be a lot of analog video. Most of the analog video is gone, so now it's just digital video. That uses, instead of an IP transport, something called an MPEG transport. And uh, the device that drives that is an edge qualm. The video goes to set-top boxes. And when you take a CMTS and edge qualm and combine them together, you get a CCAP, which is this converged cable access platform. That's it. If you know those words, you can pretty much have a conversation with anybody in, in cable. So what is next? <clears throat> so infinite broadband. We're really talking about um, how we've accomplished a lot in the last 20 years. And what exactly have we accomplished it? Let's measure it and then see how much farther we can go. Because, you know, the conversations we've been having with our customers or that they've been having with us is like, when do we get rid of this stuff? Why do we just go fiber to the home? So we have been competing against the whole fiber of the home story, and we're winning. The fiber of the home is disappearing, actually, as, as an option from the cable operator's uh, menu and also from a lot of the other service providers. So in this particular presentation, I've taken old and new technology, and I've tried to bin it into three categories. There's the classic stuff we've done for the last 20 years. There's this new phase D fiber we're about to do now. And then there's even a follow on phase to that called a fiber to the tap or a fiber to the curb. And what I do is I've got a paper that kind of goes with this where we take each of these technologies and, and talk about how fast they are and, and kind of add it all up. So here is another view of the plant. This is the hub site. And a hub site can be, head ends are nice and big, hub sites aren't. They're like a, like a little brick shack out there. Sometimes they're underground. In India, they're the shelf above the refrigerator and the gas station. It's, uh, it's amazing the, the environments that hub sites are in. But you run a point-to-point -point fiber out to a node, and then you have one node for maybe 500 homes. So you just start branching out with coax and splitting and amplifying. And so you get a bunch of amplifiers, maybe five in a row. And when you get close to the home, you go to a t what they call a tap, which has the coax that runs into the home. Uh, that is the classic HFC plant. And uh, 100, uh, not 100, uh, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, we put out our first CMTS, the UBR 7246. This was designed at Cisco, and it was the industry's first CMTS. We participated in the DOCSIS standards, and we got out there two ways. One is just by being aggressive and getting a product out there, but the other part of the story is, is we needed chips for this. And so we invested in a small little startup company. We put $3 million in a startup company called Broadcom. Might have heard of them? <laughs> well, they wanted to get in the cable market too. <clears throat> they were into set -box, box chips, but they wanted to get into data. So we invested in them, and they, had, they designed the code for their ASICs, but they didn't have enough people to do the verification. So we ran all their verification up here on our servers. So we had a copy of the code. So we put it into FPGAs, and we shipped an FPGA box, and all our competitors had to wait for the ASICs. So we had like a two-year head start on that. We actually took the market share. Motorola had 75% market share the year we entered with proprietary product, and the customers hated them. And within a year, we had that 75% market share, and Motorola was down to about 10%. It was incredible. So for the reference point, it starts off, there's 12,000 households passed uh, with DOCSIS 1.0. Uh, there was one channel, one QAM channel, it was DOCSIS 1.0. We got 27 megabits per second shared. And if you put a bunch of boxes in a hub that supports 
400,000 homes. It was a gigabit. So what have we done since then? Doxis has gone from 1.0 to 1.1, where we added voice over IP. And what I tried to put in this chart was the year that the spec came out, kind of what the spec is all about, and then what Cisco contributed to. And the story here really is that we as a company have driven these specifications. As a matter of fact, the two major contributors, I'd say, are Cisco and Broadcom to the specifications, the people who originally started working on this. Now, we have a lot of other really good competitors and partners that we work with in the standards organization. We do a really good job as a community working together. But we added voice to this back in 98. Uh, we ended up expanding the upstream in 2001. We expanded the downstream in, in 2006. Um, that's where we into, introduced IPv6 and multicast, was, as, as Cisco Technologies in there and channel bonding. You heard on the video Doxis 3.1. So what's rolling out in the field right now is Doxis 3.0. If you have like the speed, the service I have at my home is 3.0 with 24 channels. OFDM is uh, with 3.1, it's just coming online this year in select markets. So it's gonna be the technology going forward. We're already in the labs working on the next generation of technology, which is full duplex. And we'll talk about full duplex a bit, but we, we figured out a way of reusing downstream bandwidth for the upstream bandwidth and boosting the upstream by 50x faster than what it is today. It's absolutely incredible technology and it's technology invented here at Cisco. Uh, and then there's been another thing, a number of things. We, we put set-top boxes over Doxis. We, we did a whole modular CMTS architecture, which we put out there, and then Remote Fi, which is something that's pretty game-changing. All of this has come from, from uh, work on our teams. So, if we add up all those things up to Doxis 3.0, and the, you know, there's really two ways you get to increase capacity. You can make things run faster and just have more of it. So it turns out that engineered plant, the cable guys have a really clever scheme where they build the plant, they connect everybody up, and then they look to see who's using it. And so over in areas where there's colleges, where there's lots of, lots of kids using a lot of internet, that's where they start splitting the plant. And you know, instead of 500 households pass, there's maybe two groups of 250 or four groups of 125. So the moment you cut the plant in half, you get twice the capacity. So they don't, of course that costs, they have to buy more equipment, but they can keep cutting the plant in half. So sometimes we have 2,000 households passed in a serving group, and sometimes we have 200, depending upon the customer usage. That's really cool from their point of view because they get to spend money on the plant where there's plant generating revenue. So where there's revenue, they spend money. Where there's no revenue, they don't have to spend money. You contrast that with fiber to the home people, or DSL people, which have to do a lot of money all over the place, irregardless of the, the penetration, the cable guys have a really good economic model. If you add up the numbers, we're running a thousand times faster than we did 20 years ago. And to put that in perspective, when we started the cable BU, we decided to benchmark ourselves against Ethernet. Because Ethernet is a technology that took out everything else. I don't know if you guys remember Token Ring or FDDI. They all got taken out by Ethernet because Ethernet was faster and cheaper. It didn't really matter how elegant the other protocols were, faster and cheaper won the day. And the secret to faster and cheaper was good ASIC technology. And we took that to heart, we used that as a philosophy in driving the cable BU. And 1,000x in 20 years, is, you know, Ethernet goes up 10x every seven years. So that'd be 100x in 14, 1,000x in 21 years. We've kept up with Ethernet. And we're blowing away DSL and we're blowing away fiber of the home. It's working. So the question is, can we get another 1,000x out of this over the next 20 years? So deep fiber. To, we talked about how we can split the plant and get more bandwidth. So one of our customers, Comcast, figured out that, you know, right now they have a node and five amplifiers. And if they keep splitting the plant over the next 10 years, they might get down to like a node plus three amplifiers or a node plus two amplifiers. But what happens is you go to the same area over and over again and rebuild. And they figured out for the same amount of money, if they just rebuild once aggressively early, they can eliminate all the amplifiers and go to what we call an N plus zero, a node plus zero. So very small serving groups. If they planned and spent aggressively early, they'll get more bandwidth out of the plant in the long run. So that's the concept of deep fiber, is moving it all the way down here. So maybe instead of 600 households pass in survey group, there's 60. Now, this introduces an interesting problem. There is at least 10 or 20 times more nodes, which have to hook to a CMTS. So you need, let's say, 10 times the number of ports, which is, there's only so many RF ports on a box, so you need 10 times as many boxes. 
which would be great for us if we got 10 times the number of sales, but also great for the customer who has absolutely no more revenue coming in from their users. So they would like our boxes at one-tenth the price. So one-tenth the price is impossible, 10 times the number of boxes is impossible. Matter of fact, the boxes don't even fit in the hub site. So that would have been the death of Doxus. So we did a repackaging thing called Remote Phi, where we took the Phi, the RF port, out of the box and put it into a separate box. In this case, we stuck it in the node. So now, instead of this box having 56 ports, we could have 560 ports. We could achieve the 10x. In reality, they have 560 ports here. Instead of 10 times the boxes, they have maybe twice the number of boxes. So this remote Phi architecture, which we invented here at Cisco, became absolutely critical to the deployment of remote Phi. As a matter of fact, we told them this, and they, they you know, didn't really buy into it, so they went and did two deployments, so one in Sunnyvale here. And when they expanded the CMTSs from one CMTS to four CMTSs, they had to take over the break room. And the, break, the table from the break room went into the lobby, and the joke was it was going to end up in the parking lot. And in, in Sacramento, where they did the second field trial, they had to expand the building. And the joke there was you could look at the bricks on the building like rings on a tree. Every time they had equipment, they expand the building. But really, they're completely out of power and real estate and cooling in these hub sites. I've had people who want to buy, customers who want to buy new equipment just to reduce the power footprint. So we have all this fancy technology, but from a customer perspective, we're solving power and real estate problems, which are great problems to solve, by the way, because they, they buy equipment to solve those problems. <clears throat> we're, we, uh, we just launched our Remote Fire product last month. Cisco's the first customer in the marketplace with a CCAP core and a remote Phi node. Uh, we launched this in April this year. We standardized it. We wrote, we gave, we gave away, remember, we, this whole interface, we gave it all the way to the industry. We then took the software on this and we gave that away to the industry. We call it Open RPD. So why would we do that? We did it to create a market. There was, there was other competing solutions. People were putting entire CMTSs down there. So what we did is we wanted to have, first of all, we wanted to have the market dominant. Like, Fundamentally, we, we have maybe 60% market share here, 20% market share here. And the intersection between people who buy both is maybe 10%. So there's no way it could be a closed solution. We need 100% of the nodes supporting this so we can plug our CMTSs into it. So we gave our software away. And what we did is we enabled every, any, anybody who builds the CCAP core didn't trust us. So they're writing their own software, so they're behind schedule. And everybody didn't have a CMTS, so I had no idea how they work, so they just used our software. So we got in and we were the first people to interoperate and we can publicly state that. Of course, we're interoperating with our software on somebody else's node, so that went pretty well. And then we also leverage it for a partners program. So we put a strategy in place on how to use open source to actually increase our competitivity, uh, competitiveness rather than decrease it. It, it. It's working really, really well for us. And all we did from the technical perspective is we just moved the Phi chip out to a separate box and we connected it back with an IP tunnel. So the DOCSIS still runs end to end. We just manage this, this tunnel out here. We gave away the software. We have that hosted at uh, Cable Labs. Cable Labs is kind of a common development community for the cable. It's like a Belcourt type of thing. All the cable companies fund Cable Labs. And then we do our work there. There's a remote fire product that fits in the node, or you can actually put shelves shelf products down the hub site, which allows you to move the CMTS core up to the head end to save, move, save power in real estate, or actually virtualize it. So we're working on a program now to virtualize our core with this kind of being the remaining element. So Remote Phi has become an enabling technology for us to take our product and move it into the future with, with virtualization. Now, it's interesting, when you do all that, you have to connect it. So we, we solve the power and real estate problem and we created a networking problem and a management problem, right? So you go to this 4,000 4, households pass as a large hub site. So in there, we might have had uh, maybe 10 CMTSs. Once you split it apart and you go to deep fiber, you have like 6,000 of these RPDs out there, maybe 150 cores across video and data. And you know, the Ethernet switches, you need maybe 15,000 ports of Ethernet switches. And the number of pseudowires, the tunnels that connect them together, are almost a million pseudowires. We create a very complex problem. Luckily, we're a networking company. We get to sell networking equipment into that. And we're writing automation suites to hook this all together. 
So we introduced a, a product that solved a problem in the marketplace, created additional challenges, challenges our competitors are going to have to discover and solve, and, and we've got solutions for them. So we're very, very strongly positioned in this particular market. Another technology you heard in the video is DOCSIS 3.1, where we're shifting to OFDM. OFDM, so the, the way we send data down a plant right now is we use something called QAM. So the way to think of that is you've got a coax and like a wire, and on top of that you put energy. Energy is things that you can measure energy in terms of voltage or phase, you might have heard of stuff like that, but think of it as energy. If you can organize those energy into bits, once you have bits you go to bytes and you go to packets. All right, so we use a modulation we call QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation, but it's all a way of just taking energy and organizing it into bits. We use big fat QAM, six megahertz wide. In OFDM, they become 50 megahertz wide, really skinny. So in a 32 channel boundary where we used to have 32 QAMs, we now have about 8,000 of them. All right, so what's the significance of that? The significance of that is you, when we only had 32, they were all the same. Everything's the same modulation, and if the plant, if it doesn't work, you fix the plant. And that actually works, because it's an engineered plant. With the OFDM, we can actually go out to the cave modems and say, hey, how you doing? What's your power measurements? We can go and get power measurements on every modem for every single carrier, and then we can adjust the carriers if, the, if it doesn't work. The plant, from a customer's viewpoint, moves from being uh, this hardware-based plant, where everything's fixed, to a software-based plant. It's a software-driven plant. Like how the plant performs is based upon how it's measured and it's programmed. And it turns out there's areas of the plant that are really well constructed, like right after the node, that are going to get incredibly good performance. And then areas that were just like before, like average performance, and then other areas that never worked before, that we can actually make work. And that's incredibly valuable to our, our customers. It means they don't have to react as quickly to a plant that's going bad. They could see things will still work, and then they can, they can prioritize when to fix things instead of things being an emergency. So 3.1, and 3.1 is also associated with the next generation of silicon, which is more density. So 3.1 is a technology that's going to get us 3.0 took us to a gigabit downstream. 3.1 will take us to 10 gigabits in the downstream. That's shared bandwidth. So if you have a gigabit in the downstream, the rule of thumb our customers use is that the peak rate you can offer to a customer, so the rate you would get, is one third to one half of the shared rate. So a gigabit downstream, a third of that is 330. And that's what I have at my house, 330. And about 10% of the people, five to 10% of the people take that. So then there's a rate, an average rate and a low rate. Full duplex is the next really big innovation, that, and it's something that our team uh, has patents on as driving into the industry. So this is the way things work today, where there's different frequencies for the upstream and downstream. The TV channels start at 54 megahertz in the US, and they go up to 750, 850 a gig. The newest plan will be 1.2 gig. That's all downstream spectrum. There's any bit of upstream spectrum between 5 and 42 megahertz. Really only about 20 to 40 is usable. This worked out fine when we only had a small part of the spectrum. But as we get to a more and more spectrum in the downstream, there's not enough upstream to support it. You know, think about this problem, right? So again, we're always talking about how do we extend the life of DOCSIS. This is used by video, which is just, they just put video packets out. There's no AX, there's no TCP AX in the return. But this is all going to become DOCSIS. All the video will become IP. All the IP will go over TCP. And TCP is a two-way protocol, so it's going to need upstream support. And there's not enough upstream bandwidth to support all that downstream traffic. So it's another growth problem. So the old plan was you steal bandwidth from the downstream and give it to the upstream, so you have to move this around. And our team developed a technique where we could actually take this bandwidth and reuse it between upstream and downstream. This is absolutely groundbreaking. I mean, the plan has been built this way for 50 years. Since, it was, it, since the 60s, when the plant was originally put together, it was built this way. And literally, they were counting the days so when they were going to have to write off the plant and replace it with fiber because of the IP thing. And we showed up with this. And it was like, I guess we don't have to go to fiber in five years. We can stay with Cox for 15 years. We get to save billions of dollars. I have a story where I went into Cox and I presented this to them, to the business people. And they're like, oh my God. I mean, like, I, I'm video. I can't, there's certain things I can't say. But they recognized that the, the assets they had in their company, they were going to have to rebuild. So the company was actually had more longevity to it, more value to it, or something like that. So I'm sure somebody made billions of dollars off of it. I got a coaster. And that's because I stole it from the executive conference room. So, uh, so it all worked out. 
Uh, we use an echo canceller to cancel off the, the downstream and the upstream signal, which has never been used before in cable. Uh, I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll give you the one recipe slide, just so you kind of have something to walk away with. You, this is something you're not going to see in the market for about four or five years, but uh, Alexander Graham Bell had an echo cancel on his telephone. You, you pick up your telephone and energy was going both ways on that twisted pair. You and I could talk at the same time because energy goes the same way in the air, but we couldn't really understand each other because if I'm talking and you're talking, it's hard. But you know those Bose headphones? Mm -hmm. They, they listen and they cancel out. You can, you can cancel things out. If I had those on and it canceled out my voice, I would hear you. So the gold is in using the air or the coax in both directions, if you can just cancel out that echo. So that's what we do at the, at the node where we, we have one transmitter and one receiver, we just echo cancel. But the modems, the modems have one downstream, but it's everybody transmitting in the upstream. So you could cancel it yourself at a modem, but your noisy neighbor next door, you can't cancel him out. You don't have a copy of him to cancel it out. So what we do is we, we cheat. We go out, and, and it turns out, you know, if your neighbor's screaming really loud or the dog's barking, you're going to hear him. But you're not going to hear the dog 10 blocks down. It's the same thing with the cable modems. If they're far enough away, they don't interfere with each other. So we actually measure the attenuation between all the modems and figure out who's close and we put them into one frequency plan, and the other guys who are really far away, we put them into another frequency plan. So we, give, we talk to one guy, and we say, okay, here's your 3.1 frequency plan. Different frequencies for upstream and downstream. Then we go to another group that we know won't interfere, and we just give them a different frequency plan. We swap the frequencies. And then when, we add, when it all gets added up together with a plant, it, it looks like it's full duplex. So it's a really cool trick between mixing together echo cancelers and schedulers to kind of get the job done. We just did the world's first demo of full duplex Doxis over in Cologne, Germany last month at the Anga show, which is a cable show. We're working on these in specs. The ECR will be done next month, which is product three years from now. Nobody expected a demo, and we got something working. We got it working with existing cable modes because we got into a frequency range that the cable modes could, could actually adapt to. But we demonstrated packets going back and forth on a wire. It was a really major accomplishment by the team, and it hit all the press. So another good example of, of leadership at, at Cisco. It's really something for all you guys to be proud of. Actually, it's a really strong story for the company. If you take those technologies and tie them together, the move to Doxis 3.1, so that was kind of going from 1 gig to 10 gig of the downstream. Full duplex, the upstream went from 100 megabit to 5 gigabit. That's a 50x increase in the upstream. Um, we're going from maybe uh, 32 QAM or 32 TV channels. Let's say we take the entire downstream to be DOCSIS. Uh, you got all that up together, that's a 350x increase where we have ahead of us in the downstream, a 1600x in the upstream. And if you're counting bits in the, the Ethernet bits we have to switch, that hub site went from a gigabit to a terabit today. It's going to go to 350 terabits. But we're still not done. We can still take out these amps. Right now, there's still the one to five amps in here. The goal here, or sorry, we're down to one amp. The next thing we see is actually taking fiber to the curb. So if we did that, it's really a fiber to the curb and doxis to the door. Now, the immediate question is, why not just go fiber all the way to the home? And the answer is backwards compatibility. There's just stuff in that house that doesn't support direct IP connectivity. So when we do fiber down here, we can do not only DOCSIS, but video. It, does, it costs more money to go to the home. Like you can go through and upgrade 20 or 50 houses in a day if all you're doing is a plant. But if you have to dig up the driveway and replace all the components in the home, that can actually take years. So there's a lot of value in decoupling those two things together. So if we can shrink our technology to a single chip and put it in the tap, we can bring that 10 gig down, 5 gig up, right down to the curb, and then use the DOCSIS technology to go over the coax and get that to the door. As a matter of fact, if we put a four port chip in there, we could give you your very own 10 gig down, 5 gig up to your home. Now, who needs 10 gig to the home? Okay, now if it was the same price as one gig to the home, or we don't even have to go, let's say, let's say 100 megabit, right? Does anybody even, how many people have at least 100 megabit to the home? 50 megabit? You guys have at least 20 megabit to the home? 
Okay, if for the same price you could get 10 gigabit, would you get it? Yeah. So we've realized in the industry, nobody needs this bandwidth at all. I mean, there's no way you can prove that people need it. The only thing you can do is prove that people buy it, right? So from a cable company point of view, it's about customer retention, right? So literally, they'll sell the same thing all day long until Verizon shows up with fiber of the home. Boom, then upgrade. I tell you that when Google went and did their thing with fiber of the home, oh, the phones went off the hook for our, our 3.0 equipment. So the competition is really what drives the market. It's customer attention and customers will go with what's fastest and cheapest, irregardless of whether they need it. Now, if you ask your kids, of course, they do need it. They, they figure out a way of using it. And as we watch the bandwidth go through the plant, all the bandwidth actually gets get used up. Uh, we've also got ways as ASICs get faster and A to Ds and D to As get faster, we're going to go beyond the 1.2 gigahertz. We can go up to 4 gigahertz, maybe eventually 10 gigahertz. And so we'll actually be able to use that extended spectrum and mine more bandwidth out of that. And so that's kind of next on our, our path. And so if you add those last increments together, and again, we're, remember, we're, we're subdividing the plant and I'm counting that. But that's another 125x in the downstream that we can go and 300x in the upstream. You multiply these two numbers together, and remember the question was, we, we, we did 1,000x in 20 years. And we're uh, you know, the best in class when it comes to product and what our customers can do in the marketplace. And if you look at where we're going, we've got 40,000x that we can go in the downstream. And 500,000 times faster in the upstream. And if you look from where we started, 40 million x from our increase, and 100 million in the upstream. Like how many technologies? I, I can only think of one technology that's scaled like that, and that's Ethernet. Ethernet started off at a megabit, and it's at terabits now, interconnecting data centers. And that's why we hooked Ethernet as our benchmark, and we're gonna keep pace with that. And if you take that 40,000x and translate it into years, it's, it turns out it's a logarithmic thing. It's, it was an unfair thing to say another 1,000x, because that really wouldn't have counted. Um, that's another 20 or 30 years we've easily got in this system. So here is one of the th concepts that we embrace and that we push out to our customers. And that is that our goal is to make coax equivalent to fiber. Because what was our competitive threat? It was like, when do you run out of gas? What are we going to replace you with fiber? Because obviously fiber must be better, right? Turns out it's a lot of money to install fiber. So if we can be equal to fiber at less money, same value at a lower cost, we win all day long. And that's really been our objective. And it's an objective we've met. So if you go back to this node, you know, we put a remote fire in the node, so it has to connect up with fiber. By the way, when we did that, we changed the entire fiber infrastructure, or we're about to. So I remember I talked about they brought a TV spectrum down here, they had analog fiber. Well, when we put the remote fi in there, you have to flip this to Ethernet. Boom. Hundreds of thousands of miles of fiber that has to be converted over to Ethernet switching. So our Ethernet buddies love us. We've just created a huge Ethernet network that they have to connect to. And our customers love it because it used to be that that plant was owned exclusively by Doxis and Video. Now their whole plant's about to become an Ethernet, an IP or Ethernet plant, where Doxis and Video are one but of many services that go over it. They'll be able to build this fiber plant, put Doxus on it and video on it, and small cell backhaul and Wi-Fi backhaul and IoT connectivity. They're gonna do all sorts of great things with this plant. So it's an investment that pays many times over for them, all enabled by the remote Fi. And if you look at the math, you know, you're gonna have some ethernet connectivity on a wavelength, and ethernet today is 10 gig down, 10 gig up at these types of distances and price points. And we can go 10 gig down with Doxus 3.1, five gig up with full duplex, and if we have two return paths, we actually get 10 gig by 10 gig. We have a fiber equivalent story. They all have to upgrade to new technology, which is a lot of equipment that has to go in there from us which, and, and our competitors, which is all a good thing for both us and for our customers. It's a really, really nice story. This is kind of on the closing side. So here's the thing. When we, RemoteFi has been, was this slight, repackaging, where you take the Phi chip out and you put it the other end. It's like that little tiny mint wafer if you're a Monty Python fan. Just one more wafer. But as in the repackaging, 
everything changes. The whole plant has changed. Every single piece of equipment has changed. So follow this, right? First of all, you know, at the home, we can get up to, by, by putting the phi out there, we allowed scalability. So we have a way of getting to 10 gigabits per second at the home. You know, the, the, the coax plant went into a deep fiber plant. There's simply less coax. The node ends up generating the TV spectrum. Like the spectrum starts here now instead of over the hub site. If you're the guy in the hub site who goes to check with his meters what's going on, that's going to mess with your head. The fiber went from analog to digital. Probably the biggest transformation at all. Something that's not even in our business unit. This is probably the biggest impact of everything. The hub site, which used to have all that transmission equipment, like edge qualms and CMTSs, becomes nothing but a bunch of Ethernet switches. And then as we push our equipment to the head end, which is where all the video lineup is and now the DOCSIS equipment, all that gets to be virtualized. It's just software running on machines. All that becomes really a data center. We play and sell equipment into that entire food chain. And that food chain is what generates a lot of profits for our customers. So 1,000x growth to date. We have 40,000x to go. 30 years on that. It really is an infinite broadband fiber equivalent type of thing. We're connecting everybody and everyone. And the 20 years is really just the beginning of the journey. And, and this remote phi technology has become a tipping point. It's, uh, it's a great story. All right, with that, it is time for questions and uh, answers. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, you mentioned there was 60% market share in the CMTS and like 20% in the node. Who are the main competitors? We have, uh, so the size of the CMTS market, we have CMTS and HFC together. The size of that market is about a two or three billion dollar market, uh, TAM, each year. There's enough room for two and a half competitors. Uh, we've survived four generations of competitors. Um, so right now we split the market between ourselves and Eris. And then the third competitor is Casa. It used to be Motorola. Motorola got <laughs> this company, like 50, 60 years of technology, done all sorts of fantastic things, got bought for their patents by Google. And this, our, <laughs> our entire product line, our entire competitor just got chewed up and spit out. And then the heiress picked up the bits and pieces from Motorola. And uh, we actually have a bunch of Motorola people in our company now. They filled in the management roles and stuff like that. But anyway, we have room for two and a half competitors, and that's it's Asa, uh, it's Aris and Casa. Now, biting at our heels, Nokia. Nokia wants to get in the cable business. They're doing very well in mobile. Same with Huawei. Now, guess which two companies bet on putting the entire CMTS in the node? Huawei and Nokia. And guess who decided to give away the node software for free? It's pretty hard to go and compare free software to software they actually have to pay money for. So, Next question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a bunch of hidden slides in here too that have some more technical detail in them and stuff. Hello, thank you for the presentation, it was really great. And I would like to ask you, like, is this only the story about the USA or is it also about the Europe? Ah, thanks for asking that question. 50% of our market is outside the US. Yeah, we have, uh, and there are different types of markets. We have like a strong market in North America where we've got, North America is really consolidated down to a few players like Comcast, Cox, Cablevision got bought by Altice, uh, Time Warner got absorbed into Charter. There's, there's a few companies. We got Rod, We have four or five companies up in Canada, Rogers and Shaw and uh, Kojiko and Videotron. Then we have a whole bunch of companies in uh, Europe, and they're all consolidating. And then we've got uh, South and Central America. And in Europe, the, those guys tend to have very, very small hub sites. Um, but yeah, 50% is international. So Doxus is uh, it's worldwide. The only countries we don't have a lot of market penetration yet is China. Um, China actually is one of the countries we developed remote fi for because they have fiber to the buildings. They wired up everything with digital fiber, so they couldn't use the analog equipment. And then the buildings are wired with coax, because they put in coax 30 years ago so you could do broadcast propaganda in all the buildings. So they've got fiber and coax, and, and, and they need something in between, 
boom, remote file. So we actually think the remote file will help us give a really big push in China. We actually got our stuff standardized in China, but the ASICs weren't dense enough. India is the next expansion market for us as well. And India, so like, it's funny how remote file solves certain business problems. It, it solved the problem in China where it turns the old propaganda network into something that you can actually put data on. In India, it's slightly different, right? Out in the suburbs where you want to put everything, it's run by the mafia. So if you put anything you put out there, it's gone, right? Or you, you just can't go. You got you to throw something over the fence and run, right? So the remote file nodes is nothing but hardware with centralized software, right? So the mafia can own the, own the hardware and do whatever you want. You don't have to go there. You pipe all the data back to uh, Bombay or something like that. You deal with it there where it's safe. So we think remote file will be very successful in India. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's a worldwide technology. And the other the cool thing about Doxus too is, to put in perspective, the cable companies don't compete with each other. Like if you look at telcos like Verizon and AT&T, they compete with each other. They want to use something different. Ah, oh, through GSM versus ATDMA or whatever stuff. They want to use something different because they compete. Cable guys don't compete. As a matter of fact, what cable guys do is they buy each other. So it's in their best interest that the other guy uses the same technology as you. Like, their whole goal in the cable modem is like, if that cable modem costs, you know, if you can design, you know, when we standardized the cable modem and we came up with this, like, hey, isn't this great? It's standardized. And they're going, well, what's it cost? Well, standardized, it should be. I go, look, if your modem is $100 and a proprietary one is $99, that's a dollar difference. And I have to buy a million of them. That's a million dollars I can save by going to proprietary. So why is, it, is yours any better? And it's a sobering thought. Like, you just don't do things for standardization. You do it because you make things cheaper. Those modems are now 20 bucks. So everybody buys them, everybody uses the same equipment, um, and then everybody hopes to get bought by somebody who's bigger. I, I missed there was a question over here that was next. Anybody have a question? I, I think it's um, hey, so, the, so the people at WebEx can hear it. Oh. Thanks for the talk, it was really, uh informative and uh, insightful. So my Thank question you. is, uh, uh, yeah, so you talked a lot about deep fiber, right, and the cable companies. So we also see a lot of dark fiber coming into the play. And like, what, what is the play for Cisco in that market? Do you work uh, with any of those? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. There's, there's uh, multiple aspects to that. So uh, let's, let's talk about how the plant's built today. So you have a hub. And then you maybe have, you have a big run of fiber going out to the first node. So that's maybe like 20 to 80 kilometers. And then you don't have very much coax. So most of the run is fiber. That run, there's only about maybe eight fibers, 24 fibers in a good plant. So there's not a lot of fiber there. So the new fiber build will be from wherever the old node is to the new nodes. And there they can put in hundreds of fibers because the cost is in pulling the fiber. So you have to reuse the fiber that's there. And there's two ways that we're looking at doing an in industry. One is a wave division multiplexing scheme, 20 wavelengths of 10 gig. Another thing that we're looking at is something called coherent optics, where we actually use 16 qualm or something on a wavelength. And we think we can get 200 gig on a wavelength. And we're actually looking at doing a specialized version of that for the cable industry. That would be um, a fixed length and much lower cost than the coherent optics we're using in a data center. So we're looking at trying to redesign a new digital optics strategy. So getting ahead of that and being the guys who help generate the ASICs and drive the specification. This particular idea isn't ours. It's actually um, driven by cable ads and we're a big believer in it. Getting ahead of that whole trend is an enormous opportunity for, for us to do. And we have all the technology in-house. It's a matter of bringing it out of a data center market and into a cable market. So that's a huge opportunity. Then on top of that, it's all digital fiber. So we're, we're basically turning things into, into Ethernet. So if we bring down a 200 gig wavelength, we have to hook to 10 gig nodes. We're gonna need an ethernet switch that fits inside of a node that can do you know, one 200 gig in and 20 ports of 10 gig out. So we have to build that ethernet switch. So we're doing that. And we're working with the ethernet division to go make that happen. So there's new optics technologies and kind of new ethernet technologies. And then the hub site, we're gonna pack it full of 5,500 chassis is kind of the plan. But yeah, lots of opportunity for Cisco. And then you gotta network everything. You gotta hook it all up. Then you gotta manage that network. You have to have redundant paths. And all that stuff really plays to our strengths. As a matter of fact, I wanna doubly stress this point because I'm not too sure what business units are in, but this is a classic thing where this is a huge opportunity. Like, we get to recreate the world as an Ethernet network. Hundreds of thousands of miles of fiber in the plant, in the ground today that can be repurposed as Ethernet. 
but it's in a market that we're not familiar with. It's Ethernet to the curb, Ethernet to the plant. We as a company sell Ethernet to the corporation. So there's a different sales muscle involved and a different product muscle involved that it's an easy opportunity to miss. So it's, it's amazing. You guys have probably all seen it. It's amazing. A huge opportunity right in front of your face and everybody misses it because everybody's in a 20-year-old groove from where they've come from, right? So our group are in Kabu, and actually I'm over at CTO, but our group in Kabu is not going to make that Ethernet switching equipment. So we are drawing people in, screaming, dragging them in to go in you know, after this billion dollars type of opportunity. All right, what other questions have we got? Sorry. So you were showing us the spectrum and how it was divided up into downstream, upstream, and then the actual TV channels. Yep. Is that like an international standard, or each country kind of does breaking up that spectrum on their own? Yeah, good question. So it's all started with TV channels. And so in the United States, we use a 6 megahertz spacing for TV channels. So one analog signal was 6 megahertz. In the, uh, Europe, it's 8 megahertz. And somewhere, there's a seven megahertz somewhere that we have to live with, but it's mainly six and eight megahertz. So when it was analog video, that was one TV channel. When they went to standard def, they put 10 TV channels in there. And we came along and took over that six megahertz and that became about 38 megabits per second. And that'll be with OFDM maybe a bit faster than that. So with the eight megahertz, it turns out we, when we build a 32 channel box, the guys in the US get 32 times 38, and the guys in Europe get 32 times 50. They actually get more performance out of the box than, than the people over here. Although, ironically, the six megahertz modems were the first ones to get built. So the early adopters, like over in France, they wanted to deploy Doxus right away. They had to make an equipment buying decision and all they could get was six megahertz modems. So we have European properties to this day still have six megahertz on their plant because they started off with Doxus 1.0 and they had to maintain backwards compatibility. So 20 years later, they have a channel violation lineup. So the other thing is the spectrum planning. It's all six or eight megahertz channels. It always start, It starts at 54 here in Europe. It starts at uh, six. It's six. Yeah, 80, 85, 88 in the upstream. And then it goes to whatever the plant. You know, old plant is 550 megahertz. Then it's 750. Then it, as amplifiers got higher in bandwidth, and you deploy them, you have different frequency spectrums. So today, a really good plant is a gigahertz, and the next generation is 1.2 gig. So you end up with a number of channels, which is like anywhere from 100 to 160. As an operator, you have to decide what to do with those channels. And it's a painful decision. So like we had uh, operators had 80 channels of analog video, and then a little bit of digital, and then doxes. And when they started giving up the analog channels, the video guys grabbed them all and wouldn't give anything to the doxes guys. The doxes guys are one group, the video guys are another group. Obviously, cables video even though all the revenue is coming from DOCSIS. So these guys would fight over the spectrum. And they were actually building plant to get more room for DOCSIS, even though nobody else needed it. And finally, somebody realized that they were actually spending money to preserve analog. And so they eventually got rid of analog. Um, but it's a very challenging thing. I mean, they're really, they're constantly doing spectrum planning and at the root of the problem. Like if you look at your customers and how they think about things, the in cable, the root of it is spectrum planning. And freeing up bandwidth really for DOCSIS and then buying equipment to go into that, into that planning. Hi, John. I was just wondering if there was any um, changes or the innovations happening on the network side. Um, you talked about uh, maybe the CMTS a little bit, but then moved the uh, remote FI out. So I'm curious what this all means for the network. You know, we're, we're pulling the network into the access part that hasn't been in before. So there's a large growth there. Uh, there's a lot of move to 10 gig, 100 gig, a couple hundred gig. Um, we actually see segment routing as something that's probably going to emerge in this area. Uh, we have a couple of problems. One is, you know, everything used to fit into a box. It was so nice. We had this embedded C code, which is beast and monstrosity, but at least it was in one box. Now we've got two boxes, and we have to hook those together. So now we need all this automation and stuff like this. But then this box over here, it used to always be at the hub site, and we had fixed distance. So now it can move to the head end as a box, or it become virtualized in a data center. So the distance over the far end is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And instead of it being a single hop of coax, it can be now 10 hops of IP. So we've created a connectivity problem and a distance problem. And of course, once you virtualize, you're creating all sorts of different interdependencies with open source and things like that. You can actually get more accomplished, but everything is much more complicated. 
Um, luckily, I think there's solutions coming down the road, but I think we're going to stress the heck out of things like segment routing into connecting everything together. Um, millions of pseudowires that we have to manage. And, and you know, think of a simple problem, like we've developed the pseudowire protocol. We're going to hook two ends together. We'll hook a remote phi together with a, a CMTS. Simple problems show up, like when a remote phi comes online, which CMTS, like how do you hook them to a CMTS? And so we have to have a model of a CMTS in some management system that says, I have resources available. What happens is you hook up 750,000 of those and you change your spectrum plan. I want to double the bandwidth. I want to increase my DOCSIS bandwidth by 50% because the plant expands by 50% a year. That's how much extra data has to hit the plant. It's 50% a year, right? So every year, if you haven't noticed, your speeds go up. Whether you want them or not, the speeds go up. 50% increase in data downstream. That means there's a 50% impact on our equipment. The 750,000 connections we're going to put out there, that spectrum plan is going to change. We're going to have to automate that. That's kind of crazy. The connectivity is going to be changing. And then what happens if one link goes down? One link out of 750,000 pseudowires fails. Who notices? Somebody's going to notice, like a customer will notice. In the old model, if the plant failed, the customer calls, you get the call, you roll a truck, and you fix the plant. That's kind of the way things work today. That's not going to scale. We have to self-detect failures. And it'd be great if the plant could find failures and auto-fix them on its own, automated. As a matter of fact, it's mandatory that that happens. I mean, we have to build a plant that does that. So, you know, complexity never goes away. You know, what we've done is we've added scale to the plant and we've solved some fantastic business problems. Scalability, bandwidth, um, but where we're moving into an area now is automation. And, and uh, it's a software-driven plant. Uh, things are more complex. And, and you know, the rule about complexity is, is, is what we found is complexity is good as long as it works and it provides value. Like your iPhone, if you look at these iPhone things, the phone in here is terrible, right? It just doesn't work very good. It's, it's horrible quality. But everybody buys it because of the applications that are on here, right? So it works and has value. The value of the phone happens to be that you're carrying the internet in your pocket, right? So you can take that and apply to our products. You know, and if you look at our products, do they have value and does it work? And that, that applies, I say, to all of our products. And, you know, when we go to remote fi, we recognize in order to make remote fi work, we had to add automation. As a matter of fact, we start off automating our virtual platform, which is what everybody's doing at Cisco, right? You build a virtual platform and you automate it. We started building a virtual platform, we started automating it, and we came to two realizations. One is we need to automate the physical platform. And the other one was that our virtual platform actually provided no value compared to our physical box. So we actually got a virtual platform working and then scrapped it. And we're now moving from virtual to cloud. And we draw a big distinction on that, which is a whole other talk, but it's a, just very quickly to put an idea in your head. Virtual was really convenient to developers. You could take the big blob of software in one box that nobody knew what it did and move it to a VM in the cloud. And you still didn't know what it did, but you moved it to the servers, right? Which was good. It turns out it's the same software and there was not, no real differentiation. And unless you had a, doing a really bad job in your old product, the cost is the same because 80% of the development cost is software. We got that working as scrapped it. We're moving to a cloud model where we're getting rid of the blob and what we're doing is we're working on continuous integration, continuous delivery. So we get features out faster to our customers. And it's that feature delivery that provides value to our customers. And it's something we really can't do with a physical product. So again, it's got to work. It's got to add value. Any other questions? Okay, in that case, thanks very much. All right, thank you for we inviting really me today. We really appreciate you coming in. Thanks, John. Good thing. Uh, next month, we are going to cover blockchain. It's going to be externally available as well. Um, Judy Priest is our speaker, and we might have a surprise um, opening of the session. But we'll let you know. Thank you so much. <laughs>